What's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of Dad Bod History. I'm Jake. Uh, we have Eric and Cameron here tonight. And uh, we're starting a new series um, for the month of February uh, on Black History Month. Uh, as it is Black History Month, we thought we'd uh, take the next few episodes to discuss uh, different subjects and different uh, African Americans and and their influence throughout American history and their impact on American history. Um, is, but before we get into that... is Is it... Just an American month? I don't think it's celebrated worldwide. I'm sure we could check the almighty internet and find out <laughs> real quick. But yeah, I'm pretty sure it's just an American huh. uh, specific thing. That's just a thought. Interesting. Yeah. No, I mean, I've never actually thought to ask that question myself, but I'm assuming it is just an American holiday or an American uh like, do you think uh, those on the uh, the Julian calendar have it in March? So you want to start talking about Black History Month by discussing the Julian calendar. <laughs> That's how you want to bring this topic in. The... <laughs> awesome. No, 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 let's do it. Because <laughs> like the February Revolution actually happened in March or, uh -huh. or vice versa. Yeah. Just those... If you want to be technical. <laughs> so before we get into the Julian our topic calendar. tonight, <laughs> which is obviously <laughs> the merits and uh, drawbacks of the Julian versus uh, Gregorian calendar. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about black history after we finish that exhaustive yeah. topic. Does that work for you? All right. <laughs> um, but before we do get into our topic tonight, uh, make sure you guys like, subscribe, follow, uh, hit that notification bell, and uh, so we can uh, appreciate you following us. And uh, if you do not know, you can follow us on our podcast uh, anywhere you get your podcasts, which I've always thought is kind of when, right when other podcasts are saying anywhere you get your podcast. Like I was thinking about that this week. I'm like, I mean, I, I get it. There's like the big ones, Apple, Google, you know, Samsung. But is there just like some random guy in a street corner like, hey, hey, you want some podcasts? Like I got some <laughs> got some great podcasts for he's you. He's our number one dealer. Um, so. Oh, is he? Yeah. He's got a like on his... CDs. <clears throat> just hands out CDs. Yeah. He's got, yeah. A... <laughs> like, hey, got another episode you want my for mix? you. You want my mixtape? <laughs> you own the black market. This is just dad bond yeah, history. I've... I got ripped I feel off. Like... <laughs> I wanted the rap album. <laughs> I feel like his name is Tony. I don't know why, but that's that that's works. what popped into my head. All right. All right. So point being, uh, like, subscribe, we follow. Got, we got stickers and magnets too still, right? We do. I've got a few. I've got extras. So if you do want a magnet or a sticker, please uh, let us know uh, via a message or... Um, via, I don't know, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, any of our social media platforms, just let us know and we'll get you one. Oh, I will say, uh, as a follow-up to last week's episode, um, although we didn't get a ton of votes online, several people told me who their preferences were for uh, the 80s movie Well, listen, draft. if they didn't vote on Twitter, it doesn't count. I'm not taking these extra no, I know from under the I, table. I know, there's no... <laughs> There's no digital footprint, uh, but our former student, Isaiah, uh, went Peterson. He went with Jeff. Oh. Uh, I know. I know. So typical Isaiah. He, I think he just did that to upset us. Um, yeah. Yeah, of course he did. Or yeah, he loved. Because Jeff never coached him in anything. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff never had to give him a grade. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. So, I know. Um, believable so oh, there you go my own mother-in-law chose jeff as well as having the best draft but she said i got a close second so i got like a consolation prize <laughs> yeah way to soften the blow there yeah you did really good jake but you didn't do as good as jeff so okay well anyway i think our handicap was a bit higher than jeff's so yes very true. Um, okay, so I just want to follow that up. But next up, Tales from the Dad Front. You guys have any stuff going on this past week? 
Yeah, man. Um, this is a good time of year to live in Phoenix. So um, a couple of weeks ago, we went up north and played in the snow. And, you know, it's a big deal for, for Phoenix kids. And then it just dumped and dumped and dumped snow. Um, you know, it even hailed here in Phoenix. So that was a big deal. And that was last weekend. And now, no, two weekends ago. And today it was like 79. I'm looking at this. I'm a little sunburned from being outside all day with the family. But, you know, we spent all day at the park. We, um, you know, did a picnic. It was pretty sweet. And I took a page out of Eric's book and bought my kids a trampoline too. So we're <laughs> in a lot of time out there. I mean, you Great. sold it so much, Eric, with all the potential injuries that were coming my way. Yeah. And I just, I, I couldn't say no to it. Hey, I mean, yeah. if you've got insurance, I mean, use it or lose it. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> And all yeah. of a sudden, there's these <laughs> random kids showing up to the house during the day. Hey, can I jump on the trampoline? Hey, can I play with, with your kids? And, you know, I just, yeah. You're I'm that house. Collecting. You're that house on the block now. I know. Cool house. I know. Mr. Popular that's, over here. That's good. But that's, the liability is just, it's just a matter of time till one of those kids hurts himself, and then it's my problem. Yeah. Yeah, it is. But, man... You're, you're riding high until that moment. So <laughs> yeah, my kids are in an all time <laughs> popularity spike right now. That's good. That's smart. How about you, Eric? So I had a sick kid, had a fever uh, Wednesday night. So uh -huh. my wife and I swapped half day on Thursday and then, then I had him all day Friday. And it's my youngest, right? He's three and a half. My two oldest. I remember like the last couple of years when they'd get sick, one of us, my wife or I would take the day and <clears throat> be at home with them. And I always hoped that I would get the day with my daughter, the oldest, because I could just kind of be like, do your thing. And then I have eight and a half hours to take care of whatever I need to do. Right. Like there's very little work I have to do. My middle child, my son, totally different story. It's so dad, so dad, so dad, so dad, so dad, I need water. I need, and I'm like, oh, so that's a whole different story. The three and a half year old, I, I wasn't sure how it was going to go. And I turned into a butler on Friday. And uh, I swear my wife left at 7.15 with the other kids. And three hours goes by and I check my watch and it's 8.04 a.m. <laughs> and I'm like, it's, it hasn't even been an hour yet. Like this is, mm. this is going to be a long day. Yeah. The space time continuum gets messed up when kids are homesick. And it depends on the kid. Right. So I have one who will, and none of my kids when they're sick are sick. Like they're just like, no, I'm fine. I can, I can play video games. I can run around. Like you're, you're home for a reason, lay down and rest. No, I'm good. I'm going to go play. So, you know, it's funny. That was my Friday. That. My wife and I were, or our youngest, who is also um, three and a half, just she's in that stage where she just falls and hurts herself a lot. And I feel like I'm a pretty compassionate person, but I'm getting to the point with her that, you know, just, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, I will not give you a Band-Aid. You got to walk it off. And my wife said, you know, you need to kind of pick up the compassion here because she always goes to mommy now. She's learned that daddy's not going to give her any any of that. Daddy just shuts it down. So she goes straight to mommy. So okay. I'm, I'm right there with you, Eric. I think I'll be your in the room with the kids and they'll look right at me and say, mommy? And I'm like, you... Yep. I'm like, all right, well, I'm not going to complain too much, but exactly. But then I get that look from my wife, like, why, why is that what they go to? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but we go through band-aids like nobody's business too. So. Yeah. But luckily with the three and a half year old that will literally cure cancer in, in her mind. So, you know, it's you magical. get that bandaid and you're fine. It's magical. It is, it is pretty remarkable how any wound can be healed by a bandaid. Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize that they were that effective because Even a perceived wound. Can be yeah. By a 
Yeah, it's it's remarkable. My knee hurts. And I look at him like, your knee looks fine. No, it hurts. I need a Band-Aid. Well, I mean, I'm no expert, so go ahead. Take a Band-Aid. I have crushing emotional distress. Here, put a Band-Aid on your head. Yeah. <laughs> I have one more thing to share, if we have time for it. I, yeah, there's no clock tonight. Go ahead. So my parents sent um, some stuff to my daughter, and they included an envelope that had uh, what appeared to be NCAA brackets. And as I look at them, I realize uh, my mom and my dad both ended up in the championship game. And I'm like, this is awesome. And then, you know, I read the top and it says ancestry Hoffman family tree. <clears throat> and so this goes back, uh, what is this four or five generations? Um, some things I had known, um, I had known about certain like family lines, like the O'Hares and O'Laughlin's and the Kemp's, mm -hmm. the Hoffman's, the Debevoise. Like I knew those, but then I'm seeing these other names and it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, so it goes back to, um, I think the earliest one on here is like 1812 in Ireland. Oh, 1795 in Hessian, Germany, which is kind of Hesse, cool. Hesse, yeah. And, uh, but what, what starts to concern me on my dad's side is there's some names repeated in different parts of the, the tree. Ah, so the branches grew back into one another you know, is what old, you're saying here. The old cousin corral. Um, yeah. Well, actually, so, yeah, so it, it's interesting. Um, and one thing that I had always been curious about or had been curious about for a few months is uh, when I was reading Alexander Hamilton, one of his pallbearers was uh, Josiah Ogden Hoffman from New Jersey. And that's where some of the Hoffmans I'm related to come from. Um, but it turns out he's of no apparent relation. It's kind of too bad. So close. Really wanted to be descended from a pallbearer. You know, it's worthwhile. It, it's funny is that my wife is doing this. She's been on ancestry for years and she's been able to trace her family hundreds of years back in through Europe. And, mm -hmm. and then um, she has some native American ancestors as well. And she's traced them back hundreds of years as well. And then she like goes to my family tree and it's a long line of like ditch diggers and potato farmers. And like it, like she's got like ties to royal families and like all these uh, captains of industry in the early Americas. And, and then I've got some guy that grew turnips in a little patch in yeah. Southern Bohemia. Yeah. None of these like, people that's it. <laughs> thought to like start an oil magnate or a steel company. Yeah. <laughs> Just come on people. So I guess I'm, I'm glad I married. None of them this. bought Bitcoin. None of them. None of them. <laughs> they didn't like, even buy just regular coin, suckers. Apparently not. So, <laughs> all right. Can I get to my thing? Yeah, go for it. Do your thing. Okay. All right. So this weekend, uh, how do you think I got this? All right, go ahead. I don't know what's this. The, the, my background. Never oh mind. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so anyway, this weekend. Uh, you know, we just moved into our house a couple months ago and, and it's really nice. We love it. It's got these really big trees in the backyard, but then it's got like these like vines that are growing along the back fence and some smaller trees that are growing up and like through the fence and stuff like that. So this past weekend, we just spent a bunch of time chopping that down. And then this morning I went to Home Depot and bought a, a big fire ring and threw that in the middle of the yard and we just started burning stuff. We were out there for like three hours today and my son and my daughter, they wanted to help. And so they put their boots on and, and my son literally spent two hours just running around the yard, finding sticks to throw into the fire ring. And it was so cool to watch him because like, I don't know if I could be that happy just looking for different sticks to throw around, like to throw in a fire. I know I used to be that way when I was a kid. Like oh, I love well, just throwing, but like, don't you remember our trip to the cabin? We were that. Yeah. 
Yeah, we were that happy. <laughs> but there was, happiness. there was other reasons. There wasn't just the joy of throwing sticks into a fire. But um, yeah, it was just it was just really cool and and uh, to kind of just get the like you said, Cameron, like you were you were outside all day today with your family. And it was just really cool for us to be outside a lot of this weekend and just do stuff outside and not worry about looking at a screen and, you know, and, and finding other things to keep them occupied. Yeah. And that's, that's a great thing about your son is he is in his stick burning prime. Right now. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> he absolutely. It was unbelievable. Like, and he thought he was like the main man helping us out. Like, with yeah. get, get clearing all this brush out couldn't and we still got me dad no we couldn't have all those twigs thanks to you buddy <laughs> so it was it was really fun and my daughter was helping like break the branches and pull the bigger logs and stuff it was uh it was a good time nice. all right um well with that let's uh let's get rolling into our subject and so kind of to summarize this month, we're going to spend the next three weeks talking about uh, various African American or Black Americans um, throughout, obviously, American history and, and their their impact, contribution, influence in uh, in American history. And um, and and I think we're going to kind of keep it topical. So tonight, we're going to talk about like scientists, um, famous African American or Black American scientists, and. Uh, and the next week we might talk about uh, athletic or athletes or sports figures. And then maybe the following week we'll talk about like arts or something else. Um, but this week it's going to be science. And, um, and so we've got two main ones we want to talk about. And then I wrote a few other small ones that we can bring up if we, if we have time. Um, but first, uh, the first one we're going to talk about is uh, probably the most famous of the black American scientists, and that would be George Washington Carver. Um, and so we'll kind of go over his life, his, his lead in his, his career and his accomplishments and, and kind of take it from there. And then, and then we'll get into our second one. Um, and so, yeah, let's, let's get rolling. Eric, do you want to get us started? Yeah. So, um, you know, kind of researching George Washington Carver, I immediately think uh, he has some relation or some reason that he's called George Washington. And there is, um, but it's not what we think. Uh, you know, he, he was born in the 1860s, shortly before uh, slavery was abolished in Missouri. And he was born there in Missouri, uh, into slavery. Uh, his parents had been purchased by a German-American immigrant. Um, and from what I gathered, this uh, the immigrant was Moses Carver, and he was... Uh, I, I wouldn't say he was an abolitionist, but it's it doesn't seem as if he was uh, particularly like a whatever the opposite of an abolitionist is, right? Like he wasn't long to wasn't keep slavery around. Her. He wasn't pushing, yeah. but you know, he ended up with uh, George Washington Carver. Uh, we just called George um, Carver. And uh, because he had he had bought uh, Carver's parents from um, another owner, uh, and he he, he was kind of sickly as a kid. He was kidnapped as a young kid, and George or Moses Carver actually sent um, sent like a slave hunter after the kidnappers to retrieve um, retrieve these slaves. And he was only able to find George. So George and his, his brother and sister were also kidnapped. Um, but he was only able to retrieve George and he brought him back. Um, but then slavery was abolished. And so at that point, <clears throat> Moses Carver and his wife continued to raise George. Um, and he, like I said, he was kind of sickly as a, as a kid. So he was more interested in intellectual pursuits. Um, Susan Carver, uh, Moses Carver's wife, wanted to teach George how to read, how to write, um, go after these intellectual pursuits. And, you know, it's Missouri. And so 
George was not able to go to school there. Um, so he had to go to a school that was like 10 miles away for black children. Um, and so again, this is kind of where he, he gets his, his start. Um, and he kind of starts living with other families in order to, to get his education. Uh, he eventually gets to Highland uh, University. Um, he's accepted by Highland uh, University in Kansas. And then he shows up. And what do you think they find out when he shows up? I don't, I don't know. Well, he's black. So they're like, oh. no, sorry. Like you looked good oh. on paper, but no, we don't, you know, that's not going to work. Um, so he just, he left there and uh, ended up uh, in Kansas where he did some homesteading. And again, that's that he starts to do homesteading. So he's starting to get into, into agriculture and that's going to be something that he's going to find a love for. Right. So um, <clears throat> again, he, he gets loans from, from banks in order to fund his education. Uh, he does study in Iowa at Simpson College, which will be, uh, and then later on at Iowa State Agricultural Co College, now Iowa State University, um, and he studies botany there. And so he spent a lot of time learning about farming, learning about the earth, and then he actually does studies in botany and agriculture. Um, and he's the first black student there at Iowa State in 1891. Uh, and he goes after a degree in agriculture, um, and his professors are extremely impressed with him and, and set him up to continue studying with them and get his master's and be their research assistants. Um, and then he ends up teaching there, right? So um, that's kind of where he gets his start. And then he goes on. That's where he meets um, in 1896 at uh, Tuskegee, Tuskegee U Institute, the university, uh, Booker T. Washington. And so he takes, adds the name Washington to his own, becoming George oh. Washington Carver. Um, and again, he and, and Booker T. Washington, well, more he, um, in that Department of Agriculture are looking for ways to help, especially black farmers, you know, who've been new to owning their own land, find a way to maintain their, their crops, especially um, he not introduces originally, but finds ways to introduce crop rotation in a way that will help them yield more. And it's not a new development, but he finds ways to use crops specific to these parts of the country uh, to rotate them in a way that's going to produce higher yield. <clears throat> and one of those alternative cash crops is going to be peanuts. No peanut. Right. But there's not a lot to do with peanuts because peanuts are, nobody knows what to do with them. Now, he doesn't actually invent peanut butter. Oh. His, his uh, kind of achievements are going to lead to that being somebody else is going to figure it out and be like, oh, here's a good use for it. But he's trying to find other uses for um, peanuts, um, kind of like oils and different substances that peanuts can be used for, including non-food non, non -food items. Um, but he also starts this, this uh, he, he designs this mobile classroom program, which is way ahead of its time, right? He gets a wagon, um, a Jessup wagon, which is, that's what he calls it, the guy who, who helped him pay for this wagon. Um, it's a mobile classroom. It's a wagon. So he goes from town to town, opens a wagon up in a new town and shows the people, here's how, what you can do with your farm. Here's what you can do with your crops. Here's what you can grow instead. And people are like, that's fantastic. So um, yeah, that's kind of what, what he does. And, and it's a big deal because he's trying to <clears throat> not give anything to the communities that he, he's invested in, but teach them something that they can then cultivate and contribute and make their own way, uh, which is kind of more of an American yeah. way of life. I, I found it really interesting as I was reading up on him that, you know, he, he didn't really like being 
a professor. He didn't like actually teaching. He felt it was his calling in life. So just what you said, Eric, is go from town to town and educate these people that were just barely making it and turning that into, hey, you know, maybe we can actually get ahead a little bit. Maybe we can actually buy more land and, and better our families. And I think part, part of how he grew up, I mean, must have influenced that really with no parents. His, his mom was, was kidnapped, like you said, early on. And, you know, what a great legacy that was of not just discovering all these things. But he knew that, you know, the, the best way to impact others is to, to share his knowledge and not necessarily teaching in a, in a regular sense, but, you know, he, he broke the mold. And um, I found this quote on him that I thought was, was really cool. Um, spoke to just his, his humility and what kind of guy he was. And it says, quote, when you do the common things in life in an uncommon way, you will command the attention of the world. Um, I don't think he set out to change the world, but that's just kind of how, how it ended up. Um, and I listened to a, uh, interview of his late in his life and, the you know, he died in 1941, but it was in the thirties at that time. So he was an old man and, you know, really tiny and, and, you know, not in good health, but just in hearing him talk, you could tell how humble he was, just everything that, that came out of his mouth was just exceedingly, exceedingly humble. And that, that quote really did a good job of, of summing that up. Yeah. Um, he's, he's got some bangers for quotes. Um, yeah. and I, and I almost want to say that th he has to have crossed paths with John Wooden because one of his quotes is there is no shortcut to achievement. Life requires thorough preparation veneer isn't worth anything like there's no way i again i have no way to verify it but i'm certain that john wooden came across him at some point he had to john wooden is the poor man's george washington carver <laughs> that's all i'm hearing right now george washington carver would have won 20 national championships yeah yeah <laughs> yep. well it's interesting right and we talk about uh, you know, because we're talking about him as a scientist, and it's not about crop you know, rotation; it's about defensive rotation. Hey, <laughs> the tri was it the triangle? So, oh, that's, that's an offensive yeah. set. Triangle right? offense. Well, see, it still works. Yeah, success. yeah. Um, but here we're talking about like uh, he had the possibilities of the peanut, and he had 145 products. What's funny, and, and as you were talking, Eric, I was thinking about you know because one of the things that he, I, I think he got a patent for, is peanut peanut milk, like a milk substitute mm -hmm. based by the peanut. And it's like today, I don't think there's peanut milk, but there's we're soy milk. every nut. There, there's all, there's so like, we're, like, <laughs> Eric, peanut sometimes you milk, say things. Milk. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes How you say things. How do you milk things. a peanut? Okay. But like, right? Like everybody today is, yeah. you go to the store and there's, 500 different types of milk out On the there, Super Bowl. He, was, he was the predecessor for that. Oat milk now, right? Yeah. There was an ad for oat milk. Oh, was there, I don't know. I didn't. The ads were not very good. Weren't they? Okay. Some were okay. But I, I just think that some, it's interesting about him is that he's, you know, the things that he discovered, and even if they didn't come to necessarily have the impact then, you know, when he was alive, but look at what we do today. We, we we do all these milk substitutes because it's better for the environment and it's healthier. And, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people that would credit George Washington Carver as kind of the forebearer of that stream of thought when it comes to food production. Well, it's, it's um, also, maybe it's not a very American thing, um, but it's a, it's an odd thing. You know, you, you think about <clears throat> as cultures grow, um, they usually have staples in their diet. They have staple uh, grains, whether it's rice or wheat, you know, mm -hmm. um, you have certain beans, legumes, whatever it is. Um, and people just use those things in their culture because that's what's available to them. He took something that was not particularly useful uh, mm -hmm. 
and and created a market for it, right? Like, uh, you know, not everyone understands how to use a peanut. So he came up with ways to use peanuts so that more people would grow peanuts. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of like there, there's not a there's not a surplus of peanuts, but he knew that there could be a surplus of peanuts if people were rotating their crops like he suggested. So he had this problem, bad soil that can be solved by growing peanuts as one of your rotating crops, which creates another problem, too many peanuts that nobody knows what to do with. So go ahead and solve that problem, come up with products mm -hmm. that could be used from this. Well, and he didn't just like, and I'm sure you know this, but he didn't just use peanuts as a yeah. crop rotation he used. Sweet potatoes, soybeans, mm -hmm. cow, like these are all. Sweet potatoes. I know Cameron loves sweet potatoes. Like that's a staple at our house. <laughs> you know, so that's a thing is, is that, and like you said, Eric, is, is crop rotation wasn't a new thing in the, in the Western world, but clearly either we knew it and we just forgotten it or we knew it and we didn't care because especially in the South is they didn't want to rotate other crops and they wanted the cash crops was tobacco and cotton, tobacco and cotton. And if they ran, if the soil went, if, if, and if the soil went bad, you just move to new land and you do it over and over again. And so they didn't care to rotate because they just wanted to get as much money out of that. But this, by introducing uh, filthy or, capitalists, well, yeah, kind of in this case. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I was, I'm sorry, Jake. Go um, ahead. No. I, I, I found myself thinking, how did this guy not die fabulously wealthy for all the people that he helped? You know, it didn't seem like that was his focus at all. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I don't, I, I wasn't able to find anything research wise that, you know, said, oh, give me a, dollar amount in exchange for this knowledge mm -hmm. or for, for helping you or whatever. And, um, you know, he even went so far as to meeting with Gandhi. He, he got to India and met with Gandhi to develop, you know, plans for nutrition in developing countries. So, you know, on the other hand, anybody that hangs out with Gandhi probably is not really money driven. Yeah. Um, but he, he could have probably made a lot of money in that era, not, knowing what I'm talking about, but that, that just didn't come up in, uh, in what I read. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. And it, it sure seems like he had that servant's heart, so to speak. Right. Like, yeah. I mean, he, he wanted to help people. He really wanted to help, um, these newly freed, uh, black men and women and, and help them become successful at farming and homesteading, um, and, and to carry that success forward, which is, you know, it's an exceedingly rare trait in a lot of people, you know, in general, but he had no reason to be as gracious and, and, uh, selfless as he was, but he was, which makes it even more special, makes his genius even more special, I would say. Yeah. So, Absolutely. All right. Eric, do you have anything else you want to? Yeah, so there's one right. thing, and I think this is kind of, uh, you know, it is for those who, who share the Christian faith. It's it's an interesting note on him. Um, he was a Christian, and he was he was a Christian from a young from a young age, but he also kind of had a conversion experience later on. <clears throat> but he kind of had this this viewpoint, and I think it's pertinent today. And that he viewed that faith is as 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 a means or a way by which he can destroy barriers of racial problems and stratification and you know however you want to place it. if you want to talk not really identity politics because that's going too far but he saw that that religious outlook as breaking down all the barriers that existed. And while those ex those barriers <clears throat> specifically are the race that's just called black was was invented by Westerners, Americans, Europeans to set aside a group of people, Africans, as separate so that it would be easier to enslave them. Um, and seeing that that barrier is there and it's 
worn down quite a bit since 1860s. Um, it still needs to be, I would, I would opine, still needs to be broken down more. Sure. Um, but it's interesting that he, he did have a viewpoint on <clears throat> there's a racial issue, there's social disharmony, and here's how I'm going to approach breaking it down. Um, yeah. So. No, I think that's. Yeah, I, I think his faith was definitely evident in everything he did. Um, yeah, just reading about him a couple of paragraphs in, you could just tell that this guy was absolutely a believer. And that's, that's cool because he accomplished a lot, you know. Um, first national monument to honor a black person. Um, you know, I, he was either the first or one of the first to earn a bachelor's degree in this country. Um, so, I mean, super, super high accomplished person, but just absolutely was not interested in that at all. Just wanting to, to meet people and help people and, you know, just live an unbelievable life. Uh, absolutely. And I think that's a, a great way to, to segue from George uh, Washington Carver into our next uh, scientist who is Ernest Just. Um, I guess I'll take the lead on this one and get and kind of start with a summary of his life. Uh, he was born uh, in 1883 in South Carolina. His father died of alcoholism when he was four years old. So his mother raised him, his brother and his sister. Uh, she was a teacher at an all black school. And uh, when he was young, and I don't remember what age exactly, but when he was young, he uh, had typhoid for six weeks. And and obviously he recovered, but um, the recovery was long and arduous. And, and one of the side effects of the recovery was that he had forgotten how to read or write. And so he had to relearn, it, like it messed with his memory. So he had to relearn how to read and write. And his mother tried to help him um, with that. And, and eventually one day it sort of clicked again. And then he was able to, to educate himself. Okay, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you there because that's really interesting. That okay. He forgot <clears throat> how to do something because of a an illness. Yeah. And I and I have a, a friend uh, here in town who's told me a similar story of when he had he had uh, I think spinal meningitis, mm -hmm. and he tells me and he has to he has to write things down in his phone because he swears he can remember it clear as day that being in the hospital, his son was there with him. But every time he brings it up, everyone's like, no, you know, we've told you, your son was not there with you. He was not in the hospital with you. He did not have the same condition as you. It's like mm -hmm. a memory because spinal meningitis affects, you know, the spinal cord and the brain. Yeah. That memory got like planted there. Right. And, that, and that's yeah. amazing because this person is extremely sharp and looking at Ernest just having this disease that obviously affected his brain still yeah. incredibly sharp. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah. Obviously yeah. I have yeah. never had a, a disease affect my brain because I'm not nearly as sharp as these people. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you're going to take that a different direction. I thought that was going somewhere else. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and it's just like, it's remarkable. And well, like you said, with uh, George Washington Carver, he was sickly as a child, correct? That's, yeah. you know, he had poor health at a, at a young age. And the same thing with here with Ernest Jen. This was before the modern age of antibiotics and vaccines. So lots of people got typhoid. You know, that's something that happened in America and, and in the world. Um, so it's not like he was unique in getting typhoid. What's unique is that he forgot how to read and write and then taught himself to do it again as a child. That's what makes him exceptional here. Um, and continuing on his, you know, he grew up in South Carolina. His mother arranged for him to go to a, a school in uh, Kimball Union Academy in New Hampshire. And after his first year there, he was coming back home. And when he got back home for the summer, his his mother had died 
and she was buried an hour before he got back home for so like tonight is neither of his parents um he still manages to graduate from kimball in three years instead of four uh he went on to dartmouth college and he graduated magna cum laude um he was actually given an opportunity to give a commencement address there and they wanted him to but then the board said no you can't we can't have the only black graduate be the person that gives the commencement address that would be too too much of a faux pas or too on the nose um you know and and, and at dartmouth is is where he started to develop his interest in science and specifically biology and, and the fertilization and egg development of um certain creatures um, he got married in 1912 to Ethel High Warden. They had three children. Uh, he eventually divorced her in 1939 and, and married uh, Hedwig Schnetzer, who was a philosophy student in Berlin. He was actually jailed by the Nazis in 1940, um, but was shortly released thereafter, um, thanks to his second wife's family. And um, one last thing is he founded the Omega Psi Psi uh, Black Fraternity. So that's kind of a summary of his life. Now his scientific achievements were, he started teaching at Howard University in 1907, uh, became the department head of zoology in 1912, which he held until his death in 1941. Uh, he worked at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Uh, he studied the fertilization reaction and breeding habits of um, these sea creatures, uh, Anirius limbata, which I looked at it, it basically looks like a sea slug. And then an Arbacia punctulata, which is like a sea urchin. Uh, he gained his PhD from the University of Chicago, which he was one of the first black graduates to do that. Uh, he also studied in Naples, Italy. He studied in Berlin. He frequently went to Europe uh, like 10 times in the 30s um, to do studies with various scientists there. And he actually kind of gained a celebrity status there and he preferred working in Europe. He was unable to get a professor professorship in America at a mainstream or a white university. Um, and so he was always at Howard, but Howard didn't have the funding to give him for the studies that he wanted to do. And so he went to Europe, he wrote two books and 70 papers and he kind of pioneered the following area. He's like he pioneered cell fertilization and uh, hydration, cell division, dehydration in living cells, um, the ultraviolet uh, carcinogenic effects on cells, like so radiation, which was a new thing. Um, he studied that effect, its effects on cells. All these kind of things now that are hyper-specialized today and, and, and we know a whole lot about now, he was one of the first um, to study those things in depth and to provide insights into. And, you know, this is all in spite of kind of every step of the way, you know, being held back by the system or the powers that be, so to speak. You know, he wasn't given an opportunity to teach at the, the universities he wanted to teach at, even though he was absolutely capable and, and skilled and, and more than qualified to do so. And, and um, so where did, where did he go so that he could teach? Well, you're out, you know, Nazi well, he taught Germany. at Howard. <laughs> well, isn't that ironic? And yeah. he said, and here's what's funny is he says that in Europe, um, and he went to Italy in like 1929, and then he went to Germany and Paris throughout the 30s. And he said he faced less racism in Europe. And most of the time he faced racism in Europe, it was from the Americans that were there at the time. Um, which I just thought was an interesting point is that, like you said, he went to what was Nazi Germany by 19, what, 33, right? Is when Hitler yeah. was, yeah. Um, and eventually, I mean, after Hitler became the chancellor, he moved his offices from Berlin to Paris, but he still studied there and he met his second wife there. Um, but yeah, otherwise he was teaching at Howard. That was the only place he was allowed to teach, even though he was leading in all these fields of study um, 
in, in our understanding of cells and fertilization and, and cellular division. And it's then eventually curious, he died too, in 1941. The kind, of, the kind of grit and perseverance that he had. Again, I mm -hmm. love the stories where they go to a school and they're like, oh, this is a four year course. Well, I'm going to do that in three. Uh, Cause yeah. I, I got to get out of here and get moving on with doing great things. But, you know, part of his mother's story, aside from his father uh, dying of alcoholism, uh, is that his mother, um, since there was no school nearby, picked up and uh, with some other families she knew, started a new town. Yes. Called Maryville. And then Maryville, they yeah. their own school so that their, their children, African-American children, could have an education. You know, that, that's an amazing... I mean, that's, that's what great parents do is they fight for that opportunity for their children. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of a wild thing that the only way to do that is to start your own town. So. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is remarkable. And uh, you know, something that we talk about is like a quintessentially American trait is the ability to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And well, it's even harder for somebody that grew up in Jim Crow South as a, as a young black man. And it's even harder when your dad dies at four and then your mother dies your first year out, out at, at school, like and, and his ability to rise above all those circumstances. I mean, had those barriers or setbacks or tribulations, whatever you want to call them, not been there, potentially how much higher could he have gone? Would he have been able to teach at, one of the more prestigious universities would even able to advance his studies even further. Um, but what that he did. Thing. Yeah. That's the that same thing kept going through my mind as I was reading is, you know, he was certified to teach in any school in South Carolina at age 15. Yeah. You know, he does all of these things. He was a department head, you know, not just the, you know, member of the faculty, but he was a, a professor who was the department head at Howard University, and he was still in his 20s. He was not yet 30 years old. And, you know, he's the guy in that department. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's getting turned down by school after school of, no, you can't teach here. No, you can't teach here. This is a guy, you know, intelligence wise, and, you know, as far as his academic career, could have taught at Harvard or anywhere else he wanted to. And you're right. It's it's sad to think that man, as accomplished as he was, you know, if he wouldn't have hit all these roadblocks, how much further would he have gone? And you know, what what would he have discovered or, you know, studied or whatever? And and you know, you can play that game, oftentimes with many of these um, black heroes that, as accomplished as they were, is what could they have done under better circumstances? Sure. And it's heartbreaking to think about. Yeah. Because, yeah, back 100 years ago, life was hard for everybody. Um, but it was extra, extra hard for, you know, some of these people we're talking about tonight. Yeah, it, it definitely. And, and, you know, it's as you were talking, Cameron, something that came to my mind is, uh, George Washington Carver was born in 1864, right, Eric? I just said 1860s. There wasn't a, there's not okay. a specific I date. thought I saw 1864. Okay. Sometime in 19, 1864, yeah. Okay. So he was born about 19 years before Ernest Just. So George Washington, like you said with that barrier, Eric, George Washington knocked it a little bit down. And then Ernest just came about 20 years later, a generation later, and knocked it down a little bit more. And subsequently, since then, each subsequent generation of black scientists, both male and female, have been knocking those barriers down in their fields. Um, and like you said, there's still a lot of work to do, but man, it's remarkable what has happened. Um, and and those barriers, as, as you were saying, Eric, like, they're not just, those barriers aren't just to the detriment of those black men and women. They're to everybody's detriment. Like if yeah, holding George barriers. Washington Carver your back or Ernest Just back, yeah. 
that hurts America. That, like, that hurts everybody. Yeah, I mean, if if you're more willing to listen to George Washington Carver, I don't think he would have had a problem going into the South to white farmers who may have looked at him as as less than human. I don't think he would have had a problem with with sharing what he knew because he knew it was going to help everybody. Um, mm-hmm. In hit this particular case, now you have all these uh, like sharecroppers and and these freedmen who are given the forty acres and a mule and that kind of uh, that old adage, but you know, they need to know how, how to actually farm the land. And there's, yeah. there's a great deal of knowledge that goes into agriculture. And it's not something you can just, even if you've been working in the fields, you may not have picked up everything that's really required. So, you know, say, hey, we're, I'm going to share this information so we can all benefit. You miss out. And, and we talk about Ernest just being in Europe and not facing that kind of racism. And I think this kind of goes back to, we had a discussion uh, months ago about, you know, what if the South had not seceded? What if the South had succeeded at seceding? And we talked about what are the different routes that history takes if, uh, you know, the Civil War doesn't happen or it happens in a different way. And to think that slavery over the course of 150 years in American history, I know it was longer than that, but during that 150 years also kind of inculcated that not just a division between the races, but a, 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 a kind of, you know, one is, is uh, more capable and able than, than another race. Uh, and then, you know, to lose 600,000 Americans in a battle over that idea, that's going to leave, leave a lot of bitterness. So, mm-hmm. you know, to have fought a war on that scale, essentially over slavery and over how we're going to handle this group of people who've been brought here against their will is going to leave a different dynamic than in France where they just said, Oh, we're going to get rid of this and move on. And yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's very true. And, and let's, you know, I'm not painting Europe as a, obviously they're no poster child of racial equality or, or prejudice, but in this particular case, the, the especially in England and France, then them just outlawing slavery kind of, you know, it was a different dynamic certainly. Um, but yeah, it's it it is just remarkable how these these people, these men and women, overcame so much and still had such a huge impact um, in their particular fields. It goes back to our um, discussion a few weeks ago, you know, drop any of us back any time in American history, 30 years before we were born. And could we handle it? Are we, are we too soft? And uh, whether it's uh, Ernest Just or George Washington Carver or some of these other scientists uh, or any, you know, white Americans from these times, life was hard. And the barriers that anybody had to overcome to do anything that was going to impact not just their community, but their state, their region, their country is just makes me want to lay down and take a nap. <laughs> I feel you, man. I, I, uh, it, it's funny when we had that discussion, you know, of our generation is tougher yeah, or softer. None of these, the none pre- of these people could manage a podcast. Oh yeah. What you just said, you guys just compared George Washington Carver to John Wooden. You wouldn't want to listen to hours of that. Those quotes well, just Yeah, but spin. they I mean, they're not going to do all the editing and Okay. They got better <laughs> things to do. He found 145 uses for the peanut. I'm sure he can do Adobe Creative Cloud. Oh, well, he doesn't want to. He's like, uh, no, I'm just going to okay. put the peanuts. You All edited, right, Eric. Moving on. Moving on. We're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he would, and George, he would have hired you as his editor. Yes. Um, I agree with that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> where was I? I lost my outline. I don't know where I am right now. All right. So I, I did see a couple other um, scientists that I wanted to bring up briefly. Uh, the first one is Marie Maynard Daly. So she was born in 1921. So a couple of generations after Ernest Just, right? If he was born in the 1880s and then Carver was born in the 1860s. So she's a couple of generations after Just and she kind of 
knocks down that barrier a little bit more. Uh, she's the first black woman to receive a PhD in America. Uh, she received that degree from Columbia University. Um, she did research and made discoveries in histones, proteins, cholesterol, hypertension, and creatine. I'm not gonna pretend that I could tell you the specifics of those discoveries she made, but I, I did get a, a brief outline of that. She would um, be horrified at the modern American diet. Oh yes, especially <laughs> since she, she discovered a hundred years ago, hey, here's how you stay healthy. And then we said, yeah, we're good. Let's go get some more McDonald's. Um, <laughs> She was credited by Watson and Crick. And if you don't know who they are, they received the Nobel Prize um, for their mapping of the structure of DNA, I think in the mm -hmm. 50s. Do you like that? What? It was tricky. I, I did my, I did my uh, double helix. <laughs> nice. The DNA. You know, okay. <laughs> so Go an on. aside, and it's a dad aside. Uh, my son has uh, been watching. A dad side? Yeah, dad side. Uh, Jurassic Park Camp Cretaceous. It's like an animated the Netflix, Netflix show. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he, he loves it. But one day he's drawing pictures. He's like, oh, look, dad, it's an Indominus Rex. And then he points to something. And I look, he's like, and that's the DNA. And he had drawn a double helix, Jeez. a little marks between it. I'm like, oh, yeah, nice. Does the little DNA cartoon from the original movie pop up? No, Mr. Dean, does that happen? From my son's paper, probably. Not. From the original no, I don't, I don't. cartoon, does that pop? No, he does show it okay. up in the uh, Camp Cretaceous thing. Okay, think. cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And you know what? It, it's never mind. We can move on. It's not so a... Watson and Crick of Jurassic Park fame, um, <laughs> who mapped the structure of DNA in the fifties. They credited her um, in their paper for her role of ribonucleoprotein in protein synthesis, which is one of the building blocks of DNA. Uh, she was one of the first to research the effects of cholesterol and sugar on hypertension. Uh, she was also one of the earliest early researchers on the effects of cigarette smoke on the lungs. Despite what Philip Morris would tell you, uh, she found out that it is not good to breathe smoke into your lungs repeatedly. Um, yes, a lot. By I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. She uh, they went after her hard, I'm sure. And because uh, this was right, like in the 40s, that's when they were telling you, like, smoking's good for your T-zone. So, that, yeah, you know, and, and, and all TV that is nonsense. Yeah. yeah. Right on your chest. <laughs> it's good for your lungs. It makes them stronger because it's like a workout yeah. and oh all that gosh, nonsense. That, I, I love the old ads. That, like, oh, here, yeah. have some cocaine no. to help you get your job done. No, the yeah. ads are great. Around, around your baby's neck and as a, as a car seat. Yeah, <laughs> the ads are great. The health side effects are horrifying. But... Man, they were snappy. Um, <laughs> and she also researched creatine, which every gym bro out there has got to be thanking her for that. Yeah, like, I need to, I'll like, edit this and post. Oh, you're going to, you're going to throw on <laughs> some muscles and post. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's just like, like we, we talk about things that we almost take for granted. Well, yeah, everybody knows cholesterol and sugar is bad for your cholesterol and is bad for your blood pressure. But she was one of the first to like figure out the science behind that. Same thing with smoking. Like it's obvious now, everybody knows, even people that smoke, they know that's not good for them. But back then they didn't know that. Dang, and, uh, it looks cool. It does look she must cool. Have been really unpopular in her time to come to all these conclusions that, you know, yeah. for everybody to hear. Like, I wonder if she smoked. I don't know. A lot of people that's smoked a, back then. That's a great question. Yeah. So, um, Philip Morris paid her off in, in free <laughs> cigarettes. Yeah. Big tobacco got to her. Um, another one, and this one is a suggestion from my wife, uh, Benjamin Banneker, who I sadly had never really heard about um, before we brought this topic up. Uh, he was born in 1731, lived till 1806. He was a freeman, um, he was not born a slave. Um, he grew up and he went to a Quaker one-room schoolhouse when he was a kid. Primarily, he was self-taught, though. Uh, he was an inventor. He was a mathematician and astronomer. He accurately predicted solar eclipses in 1789 and 1791. Uh, he built a clock, a wooden clock, that was extremely precise, especially for its time. And then probably most famously, he sent a letter to Thomas Jefferson in 1791. And this is when Jefferson is Secretary of State under Washington. So during the time of Hamilton, um, 
asking for better for, for better conditions for African Americans and basically calling Jefferson out to live up to the words that he wrote in the Declaration of Independence, which for anybody oh. is pretty yeah, it was, it was, yeah, exactly. And I was reading it. And I was going to pull some quotes from it, but I'm reading it. And I'm like, I don't know if I can just pull quotes. I, I just highly recommend that anybody that's interested read this letter because it's 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 he just really the Declaration something. of Independence. I mean, he quotes the Declaration of Independence, which is a great document to quote. And he and he's able to he's build a case Thomas against Jefferson, Jefferson saying back to him. You're not living. You're not living up to your own words, Jefferson. You're not. Giving, you know, yes, I was born a free man, but so so many of my brothers and sisters aren't. And if you mean all men are created equal, then all men are created equal. And it's just a really great um, document, you know. It, and 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 actually, it kind of brought me to this other realization as we talk about Black History Month. And you know, a lot I know a lot of people debate, well, you know, a whole month dedicated to Black History and all that, but I, they debate like. When we talk about Black History Month, we always talk about Martin Luther King, right? Uh, often we'll talk about Malcolm X, we'll talk about Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, um, uh, George Washington Carver. But then you have these other people and these other contributors who, if you're going to teach the Declaration of Independence, which I think we should, because it's literally fundamental to American history, but then you have this other document out there contemporaneously that can say, yes, the Declaration of Independence is a wonderful founding document. But just because it's this wonderful document, there's these other points that people brought up back then that said, well, we're not living up to the promises of the Declaration. And Benjamin Banneker was one of the first to do that. And in reading it, it wasn't, I don't think it was antagonistic, although it is, I mean, he is confronting Jefferson, but I don't think it's like to me, to be antagonistic, but it's pointing out, it's like, hey man, we're not living up to what we're saying. You know, we're not walking the walk, so to speak. And I you think know, it, it's great to 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 marry those two documents when we're teaching American history. And that's interesting because it's it's a I, I'd say it's a secondary document to the Declaration of Independence, right? It's mm -hmm. a it's a response to the Declaration of Independence, not not a yes, not like in, not in opposition. But it's it's a response. It's very similar to the Constitution is foundational to the United States and how we operate, and kind of it, it's very, tied very closely to the Declaration of Independence and its founding principles. But the Federalist Papers are secondary to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Like you can you can study the Constitution and it's great, but you kind of need to study the Federalist Papers too, because they're a defense of the Constitution. And this isn't necessarily, well, no, I think this would be a defense of the Declaration of Independence. It's a defense of it in saying, let's actually, let's carry this thing out. And- Yeah, that's a really good point, you guys, because we tend to deify our founding fathers. And, oh, they were just perfect men and, you know, have these great ideas and how did they, Stand the test of time for all of these years, but we forget that these were written, maybe not by regular people, but they're written by men. You know, and yes, God's hand was on them, and God influenced their words and, and all of that. But carrying, saying it is one thing; carrying out, carrying that out is quite a different thing. And we mm -hmm. tend to romanticize. Our, our country and freedom and, and all of that. And, you know, freedom is a beautiful thing, but, you know, it's just, you guys are absolutely right. There's a reminder that there's a lot of hard work and discourse and responsibility that goes along with that, that, you know, and it, it, it this was in a text strand that we were talking about, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. And I forget how you said it, Eric, but it was, you know, I would never use a weapon that the other side didn't get access to as well. And I forget what the context was or whatever, but you know, everybody tends to think they're right all the time. And we forget, no, there's there's more than one ways to to look at this. And you know, we can all kind of strive toward a set of principles as opposed to 
right or wrong, good or bad, black or white. And, you know, it's, it's cool when we have these kind of discussions because history always repeats itself. And it's a good reminder that, man, you know, we, we need to be held to those ideals as opposed to just, oh, you know, perfection all the time. Yeah, I mean, well, and I think it, uh, go ahead, Eric, sorry. Uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr, Benjamin Franklin, like you said, they're men. Um, they're not perfect. And in fact, in some ways, they were extremely wrong. They were horrifically yeah. wrong in that they, w- the level to which they were cruel or not to slaves, uh, you know, some of the stories are that George Washington really did not like his taskmasters to be cruel to the slaves, but he wasn't always there. But to participate in that, uh, again, all the historical context aside, they were wrong. Um, But these words that they wrote in the Declaration of Independence, some of the precedents they set down in forming a government, trying to form a more perfect union, not a perfect one, but a more perfect one, um, they may have been wrong in much of their life, but in these cases, they were mostly right. And these documents, these ideas, uh, you know, we can look at them and say you're heroes for doing this, even if in other areas of your life, we can't consider you a hero. Um, <clears throat> and that's tricky because we do have a tendency to idolize people. Um, and and we should probably try not to because it yeah we always come back and tear statues down so. yeah no i agree and i think it's it's funny is you know uh, i guess as christians right it's our relationship with god is not well now you're saved and everything's good right it's a journey it's it's a relationship it's a progression and similarly i think america's uh and and all nations but america specifically is a progression and we had a a foundation and with each generation we try to like you said become more perfect we try to improve upon that and part of that is you know working towards rectifying the wrongs that exist in the world. Um, and I, I think it's just, that's why I really liked reading that letter by Benjamin Banneker. It's just like, these discussions were still happening in 1791. Like they were happening back then. They aren't new things. Um, and it was just, it was really refreshing and eye opening to see that playing out back then um, in such a public way. I mean, he, boldly sent it to Jefferson and then he sent a copy, I think to the newspaper and like, it's like, let's have the discussion. Let's talk about it. Let's figure it out. And, um, it's just so a really better than tweets. <laughs> yes. and, and, and for obvious reasons, but also, you know, it still was public. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the federalist papers, you know, and, and Alexander Hamilton constantly, uh, publishing under a pseudonym Publius, um, and some of the others took on pseudonyms to have these discussions in public and to change mm-hmm. the minds of the people. And they were well thought out. They had weeks between letters. Um, you know, you didn't send off a tweet with a misspelling and, and send it off and try to forget about it. You know, it was like you sat down with pen and paper and wrote out a response um, or yeah. wrote out the initial letter. You know, it was like, I see a problem. Let me craft this thing. So because there's nothing worse than misspelling a sick burn on Twitter. Well, yeah, which you're talk about your always co-safe. reminds me of, <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, that, that yeah. burn would have landed, but you used your and not your. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yep. He gets me every time, too. And so, and so I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not a fan of Black History Month in, in that. I don't like that it's trying to set it aside as like, you know, obvious, there's the obvious things like, oh, so we get one month and you know, everyone else gets the other 11. And, and, but also as a teacher, I don't like, <clears throat> I want to teach the course of history and, and have these stories woven throughout because that's American history is these stories of, of all of these people from all of these different parts of the world coming here 
uh, the people who are already here, all woven together in this story that is still trying to be played out. And we're still trying to make things work better for everyone um, and to maintain rights as much as possible. But um, that's how I'm, I'm, I teach history, right? So I, I, I struggle to say, we're going to stop. And then we're just going to highlight this stuff and then be done with it because it's, it's everywhere. I, when I, when I taught fifth grade, um, our science was life science was cells. And so one of the days we, we spoke specifically about Ernest Just, not because it was Black History Month, but because uh, we were studying cells and he's a very important person in, in cells and also helps us highlight this person came from, uh, his parents had been slaves. Yeah. So this is what can be accomplished um, in a place that's free. Um, so again, I, I have no problem with us doing this for Black History Month, but the idea in general, I think we should be discussing all these things all year round. All the time, right. Uh, and, and, and tying these stories together as, as they actually happen. Like this, I don't want to teach the Declaration of Independence and then six months later teach this. I want this should this letter by uh, Benjamin Banneker should be taught with the Declaration. Um, and I guess that's the, 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 yeah, the thought fantastic. that occurred to me is that is that we need to, like you said, it needs to be woven in because black history is American history and, and vice versa. Um, and I think, but I will say setting aside a month to, to, to honor black history has been good for me because obviously I'm not teaching anymore and I'm not in school anymore. So it was nice to say, well, what don't I know about yeah, yeah. Black history and to learn about these other scientists and, and their accomplishments was really refreshing and enlightening for me. But I absolutely agree with the point you're making is that as we teach the Declaration of Independence, we should teach the letter to ben, uh, Benjamin Banneker wrote, or, you know, when we're talking about cell division, you know, the study of biology, we should talk about Ernest Just, you know, and I, I totally agree with that. And I think curriculum, and now we could get into a whole other discussion about how curriculum is developed and taught, that. but <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've got my binder. Hold on. No. Um... Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because you only have so much time in a, in a school yeah. year and it, and it's, yeah. it's difficult to teach because another part of, of teaching in my opinion and my philosophy is training students to become citizens of this, of this nation and to understand our institutions as faulty as they may be. And, and from faulty beginnings, they may have, they are in fact, they, they stand above any individual or group of people. They are, we're a nation of laws, not men. And so to train students up in that and, and a lot of those institutions and laws and ideas come out of a Western tradition and, and that thread needs to be understood and honored for what it is. You know, these, these are ideas and the idea of the individual and uh, the fact that the individual is in part divine and, and that comes from the Judeo Christian tradition. So it's, and again, you only have so much time in a year. So I, I, I like to keep things kind of tight in terms of if we're studying this time period, we're going to stick to that. But I want to make sure that as many stories within that are told so that students can understand all the facets and perspectives mm -hmm. of that story. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And something as big as history, <clears throat> you know, when you're trying to teach it and when you're trying to talk about it is you know, you have to be so ambitious to lay this out and say, okay, what are the big things that each kid needs to know? And then how in the world are you going to add layers to this and context to this? It's really daunting as a history teacher, because the more that you know, and I, I, I see you guys do it even on this podcast all the time is, oh, you know, I'm, I'm consciously stopping myself from going into, you know, further detail that would detract from the, the whole conversation. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's just that, that balance of where do we enter into the black history conversation? Where does it fit into, you know, the, 
the Declaration of Independence. It's it's a really hard question to have, but you know the fact that I think that we're even discussing it is shows how smart we are, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah <We're brilliant>. obviously. <laughs> it's, it's funny. Is well, can I make a not so smart point? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> is is you, as we're discussing this, and it, as Cameron, you're and uh, and Eric are deciding, like, well, like you know, there's only so much time in a year, and it's and I was thinking, like, it's mm-hmm. like the Pro Bowl selection, like, who do you put in and who do you leave out, and is that a snub or is that justified? Like, why? I mean, there's dozens of African American scientists that we didn't talk about today, um, you know, we had to choose a couple and. Uh, and likewise, if you're building a curriculum, let's say for history, and it's like, who do you leave in? Who do you who do you, you leave out? Like, it's it's hard, but you know, and, and so you want to be representative, but man, it's it's tough. Um, so I, uh, I a few weeks ago, I, I brought some, I showed some books that I had read. They're graphic novels, and the one graphic novel is called Blades of Freedom, and it's about the Haitian slave re- revolt um, in mm. eighteen. 18- 1800, 1801, uh, that led to Napoleon saying it's not worth it. Uh, so he sold Louisiana to the United States because he needed money to put down this rebellion in Haiti. As some, you know, it, it's a slave revolt that I had no idea the extent of that slave revolt and the people involved and how vicious it was and, you know, what the conditions were. I mean, the condi- we think the conditions of slavery in the United States were bad, and they were, but some of the Caribbean islands, they were it, it 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 makes the American slavery seem less brutal in many cases, but um, I mean the Caribbean islands were just atrocious, um, and so somebody recommended. So I have that book in my classroom. My kids started flipping through it. You know, I didn't teach it; I just grabbed it and started reading it. And they enjoyed it. You know, they they learned something about this event that is not going to be hu- uh, covered in in any history that I would have taught. Um, there's some other graphic novels I'm going to pick up for World War II um, about the Japanese internment camps. Because in teaching all the stuff about World War II, and there's a ton, usually that gets half a day, right? So it's a story that needs to be told. And sometimes it's you hand something to students and say, I think you'll enjoy this. And they can grasp onto that thing and, and share it and learn it their own way. Um, but, you know, that's the free flow of ideas, free flow of information uh, is is better than the alternative. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think we could talk about this little facet of how to build a curriculum and how to get students to learn more about not just American history, but all history and, and you know, building that desire to self-discovery so to speak um hey jake but, what's your pedagogy jake what's, what's your pedagogy? my pedagogy <laughs> oh man you're giving me flashbacks of <laughs> my what was it teaching methods class it was like my second to last like it was right before i did my student teaching it was god awful um <laughs> so yes well let's wrap this episode yeah. up um good way to end <laughs> Nothing like a good pedagogy sign off to finish a really nice involved episode. Um, So thank you guys for joining us. Uh, Make sure you guys, uh, like I said, like, subscribe, follow, hit that notification bell. Um, If you you like podcasts, listen to one of our, or subscribe to our podcasts and wherever you get podcasts, be it Apple, Google, or Tony on the corner with his mixtapes. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Thank you very much.